Kayaka 052, heavy New York, good evening, climb maintain 3000. Climb number 10, 3000, and uh, we're landing on a system. Okay, uh, fly heading at 080. Avianca 052, we just uh, lost two engines, and we need the priority, please. Avianca 052, turn left heading 250, intercept the localizer. Roger. Avianca 052, you have, uh, uh, you have enough fuel to make it to the airport? Avianca 052, radar contact lost. On a cold and foggy January evening in 1990, one of the most unbelievable events in aviation history would take place. A passenger plane carrying 155 passengers and crew crashes into a Long Island suburb killing 73 people. Avianca Flight 52 ran out of fuel over New York after being stuck in holding, draining away the plane's entire fuel supply. After a failed attempt at an approach at New York's Kennedy Airport, the pilots had to abandon the landing due to violent weather and wind shear. With hardly a drop of fuel left in the tanks, the Avianca plane subsequently crashed into a neighborhood on Long Island. How did this happen? What weather did the pilots fly into? And just who was to blame for the accident? The day was January 25th, 1990. The crash of Avianca Flight 52 is one which not only includes the events which occurred during the accident flight, but also the events of the whole day of the incident, even before the plane's departure in Colombia. Poor weather in the American Northeast had been causing havoc across many of the major airports there. Multiple weather fronts have converged in the New York area. Weather fronts from the American Midwest, South, and Canada have resulted in a deep low pressure system over New York. Hundreds of flights have been delayed and even canceled across New York's multiple airports. The airports have been choked for days as passengers were left stranded trying to make their way through the crowded airports and onto the planes which were still flying. Visibility was exceptionally low on this day. Many planes of the time did not have the kind of advanced technology that we have on board planes today. In 1990, most passenger aircraft still use analog displays. Despite the bad weather, air traffic control management at Washington Center demanded a high landing and departing rate. They requested that a plane be landed at New York's John F. Kennedy Airport once roughly every two minutes. At the time, there were a total of four runways at New York's Kennedy Airport. There were two sets of parallel runways. One set marked as runway 13 left and right, and runway 31 left and right. Along with these two runways, there were the further two, which intersect on the east side of the airport. These are marked as runway 22 left and right, and runway 4 left and right. Because of difficulties in poor management and conflict with other nearby airports, runway 13 left and 13 right were closed, leaving runway 22 left and runway 22 right operating throughout the day. Because of the southerly winds that day, the reciprocal runway directions were not favorable. There were already dozens of overseas airliners heading to New York from Europe and South America. They need to land somewhere. Two and a half thousand miles south of New York in Bogota, Colombia, Preparations are underway for the departure of Avianca Airlines Flight 52 to New York's Kennedy Airport. After departure, the plane would make a stopover in the Colombian city of Medellin before its journey north to the United States. For this flight, the airline in early 1990 was utilizing a Boeing 707. The Boeing 707 was one of the first passenger jetliners, first taking flight in the late 1950s. It is a four-engine narrow-body airliner. Even in 1990, the plane was considered old. No major US carriers operated the type by then. Avianca had purchased the plane in 1977 from the American carrier Pan Am, who originally took delivery of it in 1967, making this plane at the time of the accident 22 years old. With the correct maintenance, the plane could still be reliable, albeit inefficient. Avianca would later go on to retire the plane in 1994. Leaving the Colombian capital of Bogota at just after 1 p.m. local time, it flew north to Medellin, where it arrived around one hour later. As is routine during the stopover, more passengers and luggage were taken on board. In total, there were 149 passengers who had boarded the plane in Bogota and Medellin. There were a further nine crew members, including the three members of the flight crew. The captain on board Flight 52 was 51-year-old Captain Loriano Caviedes. He was the one managing the flight controls. Caviedes had been with Avianca for over 20 years, 
and logged over 16,000 flying hours. He was lacking in his English proficiency, and so First Officer, 28-year-old Mauricio Klotz, was the one handling the communication with air traffic control. Also on board was the second officer and flight engineer, 45-year-old Matthias Moyano. On these older planes, the role of the flight engineer was to monitor the many aircraft systems through a dedicated panel located behind the first officer. During the stopover in Medellin, flight engineer Matthias Moyano conducted a fuel check once the plane was refueled. Avianca Flight 52 had taken around 36 tons of fuel for their trip to New York. It was enough for the five and a half hour flight plus up to an extra two hours of flying time. It should have been more than enough for their journey. It should also be noted that on this occasion, the autopilot was not working, and so the crew would hand fly the plane to New York. Avianca Flight 52 left Medellin at just before 10 past three in the afternoon local time. The pilots began making north towards the United States. Their route that evening would be an oceanic one. They would pass over the West Caribbean and the Bahamas, where they would join the east coast of the United States and Norfolk, Virginia. While the weather in Medellin was perfectly fine for flying, in New York, the weather had begun to deteriorate further and would further worsen throughout the evening. Weather forecasts from the day indicated heavy rain in the evening with thickening cloud. Throughout the day, the weather had already been exceedingly terrible for safe airport operations, but by nightfall, there would only be one runway for landing at Kennedy Airport, runway 22 left. By sundown, east of Florida, Avianca Flight 52 is cruising at 35,000 feet. The crew were unaware of the weather situation in New York. As their alternate airport, they had filed for Boston, a further 180 miles northeast of New York. The flight crew did not request weather information for neither of the two airports, and after contacting air traffic control in Miami, Flight 52 was cleared to a higher altitude of 37,000 feet and proceeded northbound for New York. The first indication of trouble ahead for the Avianca crew came in at 7.04 p.m., where once going on frequency with New York controllers, ATC had given the flight crew the first of what would be multiple sets of holding instructions. For 19 minutes, Avianca Flight 52 circled over Norfolk, Virginia. In the aviation industry, it is not uncommon for planes to be put into holding and have to circle away from their destination for a while if the traffic load is heavy at the destination airport. Passenger planes carry more than enough fuel for not only the amount needed to make the trip, but also a substantial amount of fuel in reserve for scenarios such as this. At 7.23, Flight 52 left the first holding at the Norfolk Vortac and continued northbound en route to New York. Nearly 200 miles to the northeast, just 80 miles from Kennedy Airport, Avianca Flight 52 was given their second hold in pattern at the Boton Airway intersection located above Atlantic City at 7.43. In this second hold, Flight 52 would stay in this holding for a further 29 minutes. By the time that they would leave Boton for their next holding, Flight 52 would have started to eat into its reserve fuel. Nonetheless, the crew of Avianca Flight 52 remain in high spirits, as at this point there was no need for concern. At 12 minutes past 8 in the evening, air traffic control cleared Flight 52 out of the Boton holding, where the plane was also descended to a lower altitude of 14,000 feet by the time that they reached their next waypoint, Cameron. The plane flew for a further 45 miles until it reached this intersection, where Flight 52 was once again placed into another holding pattern for another 29 minutes, between the time period of 8.18 and 8.47. The plane should have already landed by now as the reserve fuel begins to slowly drain away. The attitude of the flight crew would begin to change as it had become apparent that they had been in holding for so long that the opportunity to divert to their alternate airport, Boston, had now passed as they would no longer make it if necessary. At 8.44, air traffic control in New York had informed the crew of Flight 52 to expect further holding. It was at this point that First Officer Mauricio Klotz replied with this message. The controller then asked for just how long they can hold and for details about their alternate airport. The flight engineer, Matthias Moyano, would have quickly calculated an estimate for just how much longer they can feasibly hold before needing to make an approach, and the sum of that time was just 5 minutes. The first officer relayed this information to ATC, along with their alternate information, citing that they can no longer make it to Boston as they would run out of fuel. The language used by the first officer would later be criticised by some. The word he used in not only this transmission but also later radio messages was priority. At no point will the first officer use the word emergency. We will come back to this use of language later. The controller that Flight 52 had been in communication with 
then initiated a landline call to an approach controller with regards as to whether they could take Flight 52 in for an approach. The approach controller asked to slow the plane so that they would then be accepted. The controller who had been handling Flight 52 up till this point would later reveal that they did not make note of the key piece of information about Flight 52's fuel situation, and so the Avianca plane was handed off to an approach controller without them knowing that they could no longer make it to their alternate airport. Avianca Flight 52 reduced speed to 180 knots and was cleared on an approach to Kennedy Airport at 847. Because of their lack of fuel, there was effectively no other options for landing. They needed to make it on this one approach that they had. The weather had not improved at the airport, visibility was still exceptionally low, and wind shear was being reported on final. Multiple planes ahead of Flight 52 had made missed approaches. Flight 52 was then told at 8.54 to make a right-hand turn for a further holding. Not including the time between each of the holding patterns, the plane has spent over 70 minutes holding waiting to get into the airport. A significant portion of that time was spent at a lower altitude burning a higher quantity of fuel. Two minutes later, at 8.56, the approach controller clears Avianca Flight 52 onto the approach path for runway 22 left. To do this, the pilots must fly their plane northeast of the airport over Long Island before making a series of left turns to line up with the runway on a 12 mile final. As the crew of Flight 52 received their approach instructions, they were informed of potential wind shear on final. This prompted the crew to begin a briefing for a potential go around with 1,000 pounds or less of fuel. Flight engineer Matthias Moyano informed Captain Caviades that should they need to make a go around, they must slowly bring the nose of the plane up to avoid what little fuel they have left from sloshing around in the tank, risking a flameout on the engines. The flight crew were now aware of just how precarious their situation was. Despite this, they remained confident in their ability to land the plane as they were handed off to a Kennedy Tower controller. To guide them to the runway, the pilots will use the guidance of an instrument landing system, or ILS. By switching their navigation instruments to a radio frequency corresponding to the runway localizer, the onboard flight director will guide the pilots through the low visibility to the foot of runway 22 left. Ideally, all the crew needed to do in this scenario is to keep the yellow flight director markers centered on the artificial horizon instrument. Captain Caviades at the controls was the one flying the plane during this approach phase. The time was now 11 minutes past 9 in the evening, with 13 miles to fly to the runway. The captain calls off flaps and selects the ILS on his displays. Avianca Flight 52 is now lined up with the runway at 2,000 feet. In just a few minutes, they should be on the ground, and the long marathon of a flight will be over. At 9.16, the captain suggests lowering the landing gear. However, First Officer Klotz believes that it is too early to drop the gear just yet. This move to delay lowering the landing gear was likely done out of needing to increase fuel efficiency and save as much fuel as possible. The more drag on the plane, the more fuel and energy it will need to keep flying at a stable pace. The tower asked Flight 52 to increase their airspeed by 10 knots at 9.17. At 9.18, Flight 52 joins the glide slope on runway 22 left at Kennedy Airport and begins to descend to the runway. None of the pilots at this point can see the runway ahead of them. Captain Caviades requests now that the landing gear be lowered and the landing checklist is performed. With the Boeing 707 configured for landing, landing clearance was received at 9.20. So long as the pilots could find the runway through the thick fog and low visibility, they could have been able to land. However, neither the captain, first officer, nor flight engineer would be able to see the runway during this landing attempt. At just over 3 miles to the airport, the plane drops below the glide slope as is indicated by this graph detailed in the NTSB accident report. Following this, the plane would then climb above the glide slope before entering severe wind shear. Wind shear occurs when there is a region of air where the wind direction can change drastically over a short distance. At 9.23 and 8 seconds, the Boeing 707 issues a glide slope warning and the ground proximity warning system warns the plane is beginning to drop and heavily lose altitude. Over the course of the next few seconds, Avianca Flight 52 will lose around 80% of the altitude it had left. At just over 1 mile to the runway, the plane has dropped to just 200 feet above the ground. The pilots can still not find the runway. It was at this moment that Captain Caviades ordered the landing gear to be raised and makes a missed approach. Avianca Flight 52 nearly crashed on its approach attempt. At 9.23 and 34 seconds, First Officer Klotz radioed to the tower that they were making a missed approach. 
because the information regarding 552's fuel situation was lost in ATC two controllers ago, the tower is unaware of their fuel emergency. The tower directs Flight 52 away from Kennedy Airport to the east, they will need to begin their approach all over again. To do this, Flight 52 was vectored out over Long Island, where the first officer contacted New York Approach for the second time that evening. The publicly available ATC recording begins just after first officer Mauricio Klotz contacts New York Approach with the message of, Approach, Avianca 052 Heavy, we just missed a missed approach, and we are maintaining 2000. Avianca 052 Heavy, New York, good evening, climb maintain 3000. Climb on the 10 3000, and uh, we're running out of system. Okay, uh, fly heading is 080. Just before the first officer made that transmission, Captain Caviades asked him to inform Approach that they simply do not have fuel. For several minutes, Avianca Flight 52 was directed northeast of Kennedy Airport in an attempt to line the plane back up on the 12-mile final that they were given on the first approach. They have just mere minutes of fuel remaining. And Avianca 052 Heavy, uh, I'm going to bring you about 15 miles northeast and then turn you back home for the approach. Is that fine with you and your fuel? I guess so, thank you very much. Avianca 52, climb maintain 3000. Uh, negative sir, we were just running out of fuel. We, we were good. Okay, 3000, I'll be good. Okay, turn left heading 310, sir. 310, Avianca 052. On multiple occasions, according to the cockpit voice recorder transcript, the captain had asked the first officer to declare an emergency. Despite this, First Officer Klotz would never issue a mayday or even use the word emergency in his vocabulary when conversing with ATC. In lieu of this, he instead requests priority, which is not a standard term in aviation radio telephony. It is unknown as to why he used this term, even the Spanish and English word for emergency are similar in spelling and pronunciation. Although, according to a public hearing after the accident, another Avianca pilot had revealed that the term priority may have come from a Boeing bulletin which used the word in relation to fuel emergencies. At 9.32, the Boeing 707's two right board engines flame out due to fuel starvation. That was when the first officer relayed the following message to ATC. Avianca 052, we just uh, lost two engines and we need the priority, please. Avianca 052, turn left heading 250 and intercept the localizer. Roger. The approach controller did manage to issue Flight 52 with another approach clearance for ILS on runway 22 left again, and this was acknowledged by the first officer. However, 12 seconds after doing so, the cockpit voice recording ends. It is likely at this moment that the remaining two engines then flamed out, once again due to lack of fuel. Once this happened, electrical systems across the plane began shutting down. This would have included most of the aircraft's lighting. The accounts of surviving passengers recalled the distinctive sound of the engine spooling down and the wind hitting the fuselage as the plane descended to the ground. With being at a slow speed in preparation for landing, Flight 52 did not have a great deal of speed and therefore was not able to glide much further. It is unknown on what happened inside the cockpit between then and the moment that the plane came down, but according to radar data and recordings, the plane did make a turn to the left on its final descent to the ground from 3,000 feet of altitude. At 9.34, the controller issued a message to the plane to which there was no response. Avianca 052, you have, uh, uh, you have enough fuel to make it to the airport? Avianca 052, radar contact lost. Avianca Flight 52 had crashed somewhere on Long Island. The place where the plane came down was in Nassau County on the north coast of Long Island. The plane impacted on the side of a hill in a sparsely populated wooded residential area in the village of Cove Neck near the town of Oyster Bay. It's a wealthy neighborhood. Had the plane came down in a more densely populated area, the crash could have killed multiple people on the ground. When the plane crashed onto the hillside, it broke into three distinct pieces. The nose section of the plane was catapulted over 20 meters ahead of the rest of the wreckage, where it landed on the decking of a nearby home. Almost immediately following the crash, several 911 calls went out from the neighborhood. Multiple fire and police departments later arrived on the crash site, 
as it had become clear that there were indeed survivors and needed pulling from the wreckage. Many were trapped inside of the fuselage. Among those who had arrived at the scene of the crash were media crews, who were able to assist in providing lighting when needed in the rescue operation. The rescuing of passengers continued throughout the night. Because of the lack of fuel on board, there was no fire at the crash site, which enabled the rescue operations to work more quickly in bringing survivors out of the wreckage. The crash quickly spread across the United States and became headline news. In the end, out of the 158 total people on board, 85 survived while 73 perished. Among the dead were the three pilots in the cockpit, along with all but one of the flight attendants. Investigators believe that more people could have easily survived the crash landing. The blame for the death toll was in part directed to the passenger's seating. The gravitational forces inflicted on the passenger seating when the plane came down had ripped them from the flooring, effectively rendering the seat belts useless. New regulations that came in a few years prior which was supposed to replace seating regulations made back in 1952. It states that plane seats must be able to withstand a force equal to that of 16 times the force of gravity. Despite coming into effect in 1988, it only applied to new planes, as replacing all the seats on older planes was deemed to be too expensive. It would not be until nearly 20 years later in 2009 when these new seats would become mandatory on all passenger planes. As for Avianca, they offered $75,000 to the survivors of Flight 52. The US government later joined Avianca in settling for damages worth over $200 million. The carrier would later retire the Boeing 707 in 1994. In the modern day, the plane is no longer in passenger service. In the 2010s, Avianca became more than just a single airline, but an international brand to become one of the largest airlines in South America. 21 years after the accident, surviving passenger Nestor Zarate wrote a book about his experiences during and after the crash. The book, however, is somewhat scarce and was unavailable at the time of research of this video. Investigators, in the end, were divided on just who was to blame for the accident of Flight 52. Some experts cite the flight crew's actions. The captain's inability to land the plane on their first approach was cited, as was the flight engineer's lack of notifying the other flight crew members of a fuel shortage, and the first officer's use of non-standard phrasing while conversing with ATC. Some investigators also pinned blame on the air traffic control management in the United States. Controllers had been trained so that the three terms that they would respond to immediately were emergency, the pan-pan urgency call, and the mayday distress call. The controllers did not consider the word priority to be indicative of any kind of emergency. However, some believe that more should have been done when the first officer had said, we are running out of fuel. Hello, good evening everyone. Thank you so much for making it to the end of this video. I know this has been the longest video on the channel thus far. So I must thank you so much for sticking through it. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe as there are new videos every Saturday. A big thank you to my patrons from Patreon for their continuous support once again. This video was very much made possible because of my patrons. It is because of them that I was able to track down all the resources necessary to create a reconstruction in the simulator. So I must take this moment to thank them for their contributions. If you would like to get your name featured or read out at the end of the next video, you can join my Patreon from £3 per month. The link to that will be linked in the pinned comment. A thank you to my £5 patrons, Aidan Montgomery, Hector Palmatellas, Jacopo, KTP123, Ken Zachman, Christy, Murray Innes, and Pacman7. Thank you so much. And special thanks to my £10 patrons for their generous support, as always. Cherub Cherub, Daniel Hendricks, D. Rogers, Mike Milton, Side Effect, and Will Tanner. Thank you all so much. I am truly thankful for your contributions. You really helped make this video possible. Thank you. And that's it for me today. I hope you have a good weekend, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.